You know, there we go. There we go. Hey. Golly, welcome aboard, you stargazers and space freaks. It is, ladies and gentlemen, the 101st edition of the, I want to say Santa Barbara, but it's SBAU Astro Hour, the weekly get together of gentlemen from the board of the South Coast Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, which is headquartered at and supported by Santa Barbara's beautiful Museum of Natural History up in Mission Canyon. Every Monday morning, 11 a.m. to noon, we all get together through Zoom on the screen, discuss the latest news, discoveries, NASA launches out in the cosmos, as well as educating folks like me, your host, and I'm proud to be vice president of the club. And doggone, this week we're going to talk about, uh, this week, incidentally, January 30th, last two days of the month, 2023 to February 5, next Sunday, in the wake of a close pass recently by a truck-sized rock. We're going to talk about uh, asteroids. There's apparently two types, two kinds. One is more dangerous than the other. We'll kick that around. Milky Way <laughs> has a halo. You're kidding me. With RR Lyrae stars, which I probably mispronounced. We're going to go whale watching up there and do a swan dive among <laughs> constellations. A couple of occultations this week, one involving a planet. The other, a very distant rock called a Carico. Carico. Well, that's the name of the rock. It's a centaur is the type of object. Oh, I see. It's a definite name. All right. And just for the record books, Dr. Joseph Bassey of San Angelo, Texas, is going to speak to us live in Farron Hall at the museum this Friday night about space weather, followed by our museum's outgoing lead astronomy program presenter, Raphael Cottom, on March 3rd. So let's meet the gang. <laughs> President Jerry, five years. Jerry Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Good Jerry morning. Jerry. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, wife is Pat Forgey, and uh, also married to a Pat is our merchandise manager, Pat McPartland, married to Chuck McPartland, outrageously outreachable outreach coordinator, who's going to yeah. give us a little update on what's going on since he posted it online. We might as well follow up. It's also in the newsletter, which is out, and here's the man who runs that, Tom Whittemore, former West morning. College science instructor, editor of SBAU Newsletter. Got to tell you, folks, if you're part of the crew but have never met us, come see us. Come join us 6.30 on uh, Friday night and get to go into the planetarium next door before the meeting and Dr. Bassey's speech. Did I mention Joseph Bassey? I didn't tell yeah. you his name, did I? Yeah, you did. And it's not 6.30, Ron. It's, it's actually, we start at 7, so getting there at 6.30 might be a little early. <laughs> That's true. I get there at 6.30, a lot of the other people, but between 6.30 and 7, and then we have a ad lib sky show featuring Chrissy Cook, who's, uh, what, planetary director? What is her title? I get these titles mixed up. Astronomy Program Specialist. Okay. How come we haven't met uh, Dr. Cottom before? Uh, he's not a doctor. Um, oh, he's not? I tell no, you. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a student. He's from Greece. He's Greek. Well, I know and, that, but uh, he's come over to uh, study astrophysics, and he's talking about going up to UC Santa Cruz uh, in the future here for work on his PhD. Hmm. But he holds the title, does he not? Lead astronomy programs presenter for the museum. Um, I hadn't heard that before, but um, I know that he used to be working for Chrissy, and then they shifted stuff around. So I, I don't know what kind of title they gave him. So he didn't have an office there, but she recommended I book him and got him next month. So uh, we get a lot of silly stuff. These are President Jerry's forwarded silly science <laughs> cartoons. We've got enough to cover two weeks here. So I'll just see what he throws up on the screen since he's our webmaster on duty for SBA US per hour. Here it comes. God knows it could be far. Uh, why Earth is the best planet in our solar system. We're the bacon and the rest of them are no bacon. The bacon is available here. It's not available there. You have to send out. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> but we're making plans to put McDonald's on all those other places, I'm sure. Why Earth is the best. Okay. Here's uh, <laughs> a walking target for a billy goat. <laughs> when worlds collide, they walk out and they're, uh, they're actually ambulatory butts. With a <laughs> That's a good one. And coming out of the water in the future, a few million years from now, oh, my God, all that plastic, the plastic bottle. Single-use bottles. Yeah, got legs. 
So we'll have a plastic culture in the future. That's a nightmare. Ah, a spaceship crashes into the water and there's one guy alone on, on the desert island with one palm tree and here come these aliens swimming toward him. <laughs> that far side? Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah, Larson down here. That's Larson. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, this guy's being sucked up into a UFO. He said, wait, I forgot my mask. Because uh, if you think about it, don't use the mask and you'll kill them all. You remember H.G. Wells, how he ended yeah. his book? Mm -hmm. That would work. Okay, well, you're going to have to enlarge this one, Jerry. Can't go to my notes. Ah, in this case, <laughs> it looks like in a parallel universe where apples have enormous density, Newton discovers anti-gravity, I guess. <coughs> no, gravity. Oh. Yeah, he's sucked up to the apple is so dense that the apple's gravity dominates and pulls Newton up into it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's Took the me only a moment one. at first, too. <laughs> now, that's not a myth that he saw an apple fall, is it? That, 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 actually... is, a, that is a myth. It's up there with chopping a cherry tree for George. Okay, got but, it. But they do, his, his uh, ancestral home did have apple trees and yeah. they preserved some of them for, for a while. I don't know if they're all still alive, but at least one is, I think. Well, I'm sure Socrates and the guys in the Greek uh, 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 Agora must have seen things fall and go, what the hell? What the hell is this one? <laughs> oh, we have an astronaut left behind on the moon. Dear Henry, says the note, where were you? We waited, but finally decided, <laughs> and there they go, back to Earth. <laughs> yep. All right, Space World, Bob's Shoe World. I'm sorry. Listen, just follow our distress beacon and send some help. We're in quadrant 57. Are these the uh, aliens or are they Americans? That's the aliens. No, the Amer aliens. Okay, aliens have uh, crashed, landed on, on a street in Brooklyn, and quadrant 57 of the Milky Way is a planet called Bob's Shoe World. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, cargo space. Read that a little slower. Car, go space. No, car, no, do that. Car, go road. <laughs> uh, okay. We heard of a guy here who was from Romania and he emigrated here. He was a physics professor and he wanted to learn English. And people suggested he go to Toastmasters and learn public speaking. <laughs> and they assigned him a topic of uh, why do we drive on the side of the road we drive on? So he gave a whole talk on why. It's so much more energy intensive if you try to drive on the underside of the road. So it's much easier <laughs> to drive on the top side. Well, I've always wondered how do they do that one in one country that has left side of the road borders with a country that has right side of the road. How do they cross over at the border? There's a big crane and it lifts the car over. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a mutual parking lot they get into and then go out the other side. <laughs> And I've always wondered if they walk on the sidewalk the same, and they do. I could <laughs> check out the traffic in downtown Tokyo where they are left. Ah, here we go, a potato in space. We're going to talk about asteroids and a new type. There's two types, right? The good and the bad. Well, there's multiple types, but the, this is another. Yeah, you can you can think of it as a category. Which one is this, dear? Itakawa. This yeah. Oh, is this the one the Japanese went to? Yeah. J yeah this is taken by JAXA. Jackson. This is a colorized photo from uh, the Japanese Exploration Agency. I forgot what the Astronomical Exploration Agency. I, this is the one where I'm doing slideshows in grade school. I always say this is dog poop rolled in gravel. That's kind of have that look to it, doesn't it? <laughs> Might it be two small ones together that came? It looks like it. It's probably at least two small ones. It's a, probably, I think this is a gravel pile. Yeah. And the point of the it being there is that this is um, in the wake of our DART mission, where we slammed into the smaller of two, dim, uh, could you pronounce that, Chuck? Dimorphos. Uh, Didymos and Dimorphos. Okay. So we slammed into Didymos, I think it was, the small one. No, Dimorphos is the small Dimorph one. I had a 50-50 chance. Yeah. It used to be called Diddy Moon. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what happened was they got a they got a bigger. Um, it was a test of trying to move, see if we could move an asteroid to the side, change its orbit, and essentially the result was yes. 
Um, but the, the uh, impact was much more productive of debris than was expected or hoped for. And that could be a problem because some of these rock pot gravel pile things, you just scatter them. You don't move. It's not a solid body. It, you can't re just move it over easily if you hit it. So the, it's an issue of how to treat these things uh, for well, planetary I think defense. My my suspicion on reading the article was that it was written before DART. Yeah. Uh, because we got a much better result than we expected. And this might, you know, that might work for these rubble piles. Instead of turning them into shotgun blasts, it, it might divert them quite well. Yeah. You still get some of the debris hitting. And I read yeah. in one place that if you got a bunch of the debris, it spreads out the, uh, you know, there's still all this kinetic energy coming that gets turned into heat and you spread it out and you cook the earth if you hit it, you know, with a shotgun blast. But then you got uh, Phil Lubin's group out there at UCSB saying, yeah, but if it's smaller, it decelerates quicker. And so you don't deposit quite as much as heat. So it might be yeah. all right. So I don't think we know yet. No, this was speculative, as you pointed out uh, before. Um, and we did get, they expected a certain change in orbit. Um, got to forget the expected size, but they got like 23 minute change in the orbital period, which was bigger than they expected to get it to move to side. But it was also more productive in debris than they thought. And that was evidence of its being um, a rubble pile, but it did move to the side. So we've got things to work on there. This is an end on picture of the same uh, asteroid showing boulders there. This is 100 meters. It's not a gigantic asteroid. Well, now clear this up for me, gentlemen. I, the initial statement you made was that this was the one the Japanese uh, probe brought back stuff yes. from. Wasn't that a different one than that that we crashed into with DART? That was yes, it was a different one. Okay, so we're not looking at the Japanese one. Yes, we are. This is the Japanese one. Okay, but we're talking about DART. Well, no, I was talking about DART. Yeah, it's yeah. I right. it's, it's it's two it's two asteroids that are of this rubble pile class and what kind okay. of effects we managed to get trying to divert them okay so we don't have a picture of the one dart hit well we uh do. i don't know if there's one in our uh, talk here but we do have pictures of it yeah yeah okay but one rubble pile looks just like another rubble pile yeah. especially so up close the <laughs> japanese uh, the japanese aerospace exploration agency has visited itakawa itakawa <laughs> and ryugu itakawa. And NASA has um, been to asteroid Bennu, and we've also been to Didymos, Didymoon. It's the one with the moonlet around it. It's the, yeah, it's the or that's the uh, yes. And these are all examples of rubble pile, huh? Which means they crack up and become the other side, which is no. Like they're already cracked up. It's just gravity, weak gravity. If you take two pieces of gravel from your backyard <laughs> and you put them out in space way out in space away from everything else you just leave them there at rest and then eventually their mutual gravitational attraction will pull them together and they will just lay against each other they don't necessarily stick together although things in a vacuum uh can there's no if there's no oxygen to uh, interact with the surface and you get the actual end of the crystal structure, you can get um, van der Waals force holding them together. So they do kind of stick together. And that's a problem for machines in space what, that have mechanisms and that have joints. Two metal surfaces that are absolutely clean and um, flat, you stick them together and they will not come apart. They weld, just contact weld. So that's been a problem we deal with in our spacecraft putting uh, materials together that don't do that. But these well, asteroids are not designed to not do that. So they can <laughs> stick together, even though they were a rubble pile. But they don't, they don't become, based on what you just said, those real hard rocks that become Chuck's meteors, meteorites. They're not, they're not monolithic, meaning okay. single stone. They have, monoliths have to come from a much bigger, um, object right almost planet size to get that thick and hard and well to get something that's a uniform very dense blob of like metal then you have to have it be a differentiated body it comes from that has to have a certain size yes 
Yeah, there's a there's an asteroid called Psyche that's believed to be a solid metal um, asteroid, and we've got a mission that's going to take off, I guess, this year um, yeah. for Psyche, and it will get there in 21, something like that. And but that's a that's a known hard body. Psyche, which has P S Y C H E. Yeah, Psyche, mm -hmm. like that's the Greek Psyche. god. Yeah, I think it was a goddess. Chuck. Goddess, oh, it's a goddess, goddess of mental illness of souls or something. Yeah. yeah, the basis of the word psychology and psychiatry, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I'll be psycho. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that those solid body ones are very interesting. Uh, science fiction, I'm a big fan. Has discussed those things for years, mining them and tunneling into them, and if they have structural integrity. You just put an airlock on one end of your tunnel and fill it with oxygen, and then you can live in there. <laughs> Ready-made spaceship. Yeah, as long as you bring a lot of MREs with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you then you could call it Omumu. <laughs> <laughs> How about the uh, big, long, rectangular black ones that are floating in space and end up at the foot of your deathbed? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Haven't had that dream yet. Well, I mean, it's monoliths. So that's one of these. That's how yep. that Kubrick called it. Psyche, Psyche could be a monolith, <laughs> but not a perfectly rectangular solid one. I got you, rubble piles. Now, didn't this come, you headlined this part, Mr. President, with um, it could be a problem. Is it coming close to us? Might it crash? No, that's us? not the problem. Um, most of these, a lot of, a lot of, a high percentage of the population of asteroids are rubble piles. And as Chuck pointed out a moment ago, uh, this was before DART showed that you can move to the side. This article was speculating that they might be a bigger problem because if you blow them up, they just pop apart and then they slowly come back together, or they just hit us as a shotgun blast instead of a bullet. Um, so it, it, they rip you can't necessarily get rid of it by um, bouncing off it. But data showed us that there is hope there. We can push them to, to the side. But I understand that if a big rock were coming right toward the earth and they sent a nuke out, it would just make a bunch of little rocks, which would just do me even as much damage as the big one, only a lot of more places on the earth. Yeah, this is the same deal, except you don't have to nuke it to get all the little rocks. Oh. How do you do it? You hit it with it's all it's already little rocks just piled together. Oh, I see that. There's a, the thing that was years ago. I remember there was a lot of conference or something on how to divert asteroids, and one of the astronauts had proposed a gravitational tractor satellite that you launch a heavy satellite up and put it near the asteroid, and the two will gravitationally attract each other but you keep moving your spacecraft, you keep moving it away. So the asteroid has to do all the moving. There you go. You gravitationally pull it out of its path. Now, well, another, another option is you splash sunscreen, highly reflective white paint on it and reflecting sunlight imparts momentum to the object. And so you can change its orbit very gradually, but if you do it <laughs> far enough away, it's enough to make it miss. <laughs> Well, now the the one that just passed between Earth and the Moon, yeah, is about the size of a delivery truck. That's a pretty good sized rock, and they said I read that it might burn up before it hit the ground and give you a real spectacular, <laughs> like the Russian one. Uh, several, yeah, yeah. Tom, oh no, I'm I'm just listening. Oh, okay. I read, but, yeah, I read that speculation too, but it, it, we don't have a chance to prove it because it didn't it it missed us. It passed about 2,200 miles above us. And, um, you know, it, uh, it also depends on what it's made out of. If it's a rubble pile or a rock with cracks, then it would tend to um, vaporize more. But yeah, if it's yeah. a solid metal thing, then it might survive a little deeper. Yeah. yeah. I guess well, I was just thinking about Chuck's comment on the sunscreen. And so what, what color would you make this sunscreen to get the best, best uh, momentum reaction? They wanted white. It should have uh, black, huh? Well, uh, black well, I, I think light. you wanted to reflect. Actually, yeah, actually white, white yeah. would work. White's work because the photons would yeah. bounce. It yeah. works twice as well as black. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Still don't understand why the peoples of Africa are black when they're they get the most sun and they probably heat up far more than the whites of Scandinavia. There's something wrong there. I don't out of our out of our uh, realm of confidence or okay. competence here. Yep. This is M3. The, uh, yeah, this is M3 globular cluster, beautiful globular cluster. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it's my background on my watch, on my um, cell, cell phone. But the common in these globular clusters is a um, standard candle called an RR Lyra star. Mm -hmm. And this is a Hertzsprung Russell diagram for M5. Couldn't find one for M3, but I could probably look harder. So this is a brightness versus um, temperature. Um, color. Yeah, thanks. Color, temperature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, temperature versus color. You remember the ladies back in uh, 1890 and 1900 that um, discovered the color of the star? Is it rough indication of its temperature? Mm -hmm. This is this, uh, an, an, an evolution of that rule into now a lot more detail in it. It's not just a linear function, but approximates it. But this shows all the stars, about 15,000 stars in M5. And these ones here that are in green on this flat part here are RR Lyra stars. Mm -hmm. Now, this is these are fairly faint stars. They're small. They're about... 80% of the size of our sun. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they have a um, periodicity, they're variable stars, and they have a periodicity versus luminosity relationship mm -hmm. similar to Cepheid variables. Right. Except these things are very common in globular clusters. Right. And globular clusters uh, shed these stars. And the point of this is that this that this this is an illustration it's not a photograph of our milky way and it shows um the recent discovery they found 208 rr lyra stars that inhabit this outer halo mm -hmm. uh, identified individual stars and measured their um variability their period and mm -hmm. have determined how far away they are and so they apparently were shed from globular clusters or never were in globular clusters, mm -hmm. but they form a halo, a set of halos around our galaxy. And this is what um, you may have heard recently that now speculation is that our galaxy reaches halfway to the actual edge of it, if you define it that way, reaches about halfway to the Andromeda galaxy. It's over a million, mile, million light years um, across. Yeah, they found a gravitationally bound globular cluster out there at that distance. Yeah. So we're looking at, for the first time, outer halos. It's sort of a um, Oort cloud for our galaxy. Wow. Things that did not collapse into a disk yet. Yeah. The inner halo. Gary, is... I was just, just going to mention what I remember about our, our Lyrae's was that the periodicity, uh, you know, has, has a similar uh, periodic response as do, do the Cepheids but a uh, different frequency. And so I remember in the 50s, I think it set the scale of the universe up by a factor of two or something like that, because yeah. they, they didn't realize that these things were special types of Cepheids. These are early rays. Sound right, Chuck? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there was all this yeah. speculation that, wait a minute, this this doesn't jive. And, and finally they figured out, oh, that's because we're misinterpreting one type. Right, and that, now, that's most the universe twice as big as we thought. Right, I think yeah. there's something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Our our Lyra's um, Cepheid variable relationship mm -hmm. is primarily in the ultraviolet, and okay. uh, this is work that was done, I think, by James Webb in spotting these things. Okay. So um, we now are looking out at the thin edge of our galaxy. When I was a kid, this was about 100,000 light years across yeah. center, and we were out here at about um, 30,000, two, two thirds, yeah, 30,000 light years yeah. here. Now we've been uh, newly subordinated, being way close to the center. Wow. So, so all that blur that we're seeing, those are stars? Yeah. Good Lord. Except that this is a drawing. Yeah. 
far yeah. less dense than our stars are far enough apart inside the galaxy. Imagine <laughs> how far apart they are out there. Space mm -hmm. is space. I guess so, but would there be the equivalent number of stars that are inside the galaxy itself, you suppose, around us that get lost the, in space? The, because the, the area is very big around here, so to have a significant halo, I would say it represents a tremendous number of stars, but very low density. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But wow. the inner inner halo could be compared to the Kuiper belt around our solar system, and the outer halo would be just a big sphere like uh, the Oort cloud, right? Well, the, the inner halo is a sphere too, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> they've, it, they've, they've drawn it here as an ellipsoid, which implies that it is uh, somewhat flattened. Yeah, more bound to the outer halo is spherical and has so. Otherwise, there's no difference between them or there's... Well, it's denser. Made up, yeah, they're just made up of stars and dust, very, very tenuous. I, so even though we can't see them in distant galaxies, there's a chance that they probably all have the same thing going for them, doesn't it? We it's harder to see. Of... What? Gentlemen? It's harder to see on more distant galaxies, but sure, yeah, yeah they, they'll have right. them. Yeah, we, we shouldn't be unusual, Ron, you know? Well, are there stars that are closer together than we are with Centauri Alpha? In other could, words, could they have overlapping halos? <laughs> Oh, galaxies, you oh, mean? Oh, galaxies. Those are galaxies. Yeah, the halos are associated with galaxies. Yeah, I remember last week, or yeah, we did the um, uh, ring, I'll get it right. Ring galaxies. galaxies. Yeah, mm -hmm. the ring and, galaxies. Uh, they actually were in collision. So mm -hmm. they not only overlap, they smack. And, yeah. and if we are finding that this outer halo goes, you know, a million light years, and you speculate that, well, Andromeda probably has another one that goes a million light years, they're getting pretty close to touching outer halos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. stuff, halfway, stuff halfway in between gets to choose its own uh, home. Yeah. <laughs> Pick your galaxy. Yeah. I'm starting to believe what they say. There's uh, more stars in the universe than there are sand, grains of sand yeah. on the earth. Mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. they are. Especially after this last storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go to the night sky. What are we talking about here? Enough on our, our Lyrae stars. This would be, oh, are we up in the green comet? No, this is Cetus, which is just setting now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is a very up. early evening, um, very early evening constellation. It's got a lot of interesting stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Whale watching. Mm -hmm. The uh, mm -hmm. fourth, fourth largest of 88 constellations. Mm -hmm. Cetus. Yeah. Shows it right here. Um, Myra. Mm -hmm. Where is the... Oh, yeah, there it is. Mantar. Yeah. Well, uh, lots, of, lots of Messier objects in it. We have three uh, asteroids working its way through. Juno, mm -hmm. Vesta, and Astrea. Wow. Plus, it's also got uh, Jupiter now is uh, getting toward the west and getting out of our skies early in the evening. Mm -hmm. Saturn is already gone. Mm -hmm. uh, Jupiter you is in Cetus? Uh, Jupiter, I don't know if it's actually in Cetus. It looks like it's closer to Pisces. Yeah. yeah. But it, this is but it can go through Cetus. You know, that's another one of these. Well, yeah. counted as part of the Zodiac. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the zodiac's not a fine pencil line; it's a marker broadband tip, broadband. Yeah. So, Ron, just I was just going to mention, Jerry, just a little head up on Jupiter for Ron: is Jupiter takes about twelve years to go around the sun. So, from our perspective, you can think of it walking through each of the zodiacal constellations every year. You know, just kind of a nice way to think about it. Wouldn't mm -hmm. all the planets do that? No, no, this one takes twelve rates. years. Say yeah. again, gentlemen. You they do it at different you. rates. So Jupiter takes 12 years to go around. And if you consider there are 12 Zodiac constellations, it switches from constellation to constellation each yeah. year. Mm -hmm. that so so if, if it's in Capricorn one year, next year it's likely to be in, in Sagittarius, Ron. Do you suppose if, I got the, if I got the direction right, Chuck. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> what would be fun is to get some stars inside Cetus and make them an asterism called Pinocchio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the word Kaito. Oh, we, have is, two, is, we have two comets here. Oh. We have 9P Temple and 2P Enke. 
-hmm. Now, these are very far away. You're going to need a very big telescope to find them. Hmm. So, and I was just going to mention to you guys on Friday night, about 10 o'clock, we'd, we'd just gotten back here from a concert and I took the binoculars out and I, it, it was a little cloudy in the northern sky. And I tried to find the, the, the Emerald Comet with yeah. my binoculars and I didn't quite get it. Uh, last night was a wash, but in the next few nights is the night to try to get this thing with binoculars. It's because it's, yeah, I was just going to say it's kind of scooting in between the dippers right now. Yeah. And it's magnitude 4.6. Oh, okay. So we should <laughs> get zooming up there. And uh, last night, if we could, would have been able to see it, it was a great way to find it was you could take the pointer stars in the Big Dipper. Yeah. And then imagine the two stars that would correspond in the Little Dipper and use those as pointers. And it was right where the intersecting point was. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. And I think on the second, it's the closest to the Earth, right, Chuck? First or second, yeah. I, I don't know yeah. whether those are UTC or our time. Yeah, okay. And you can see it's moving faster and faster with those yeah, time it's going lickety, lickety split. <laughs> so when I, when I saw it, it was right here. Okay. And um, today's the 30th, yeah. so it's right up here. It's going real fast. Yeah. Uh, I tipped this up because if you look north, this is the way it's going. And Mars okay. is actually down on the close to the southern horizon, so this wrap over the top of the sky. Wow! Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a and this um, this is my picture from last night. Um, what last was night it was too cloudy. Maybe, probably this is, this maybe Friday. Friday maybe Friday, Friday night. Perry? This is Friday night. This is a, yeah. a single frame with the DSLR Canon and a ten inch. F5 Newtonian, it's a 30 second snapshot. Wow. Um, longer than that. And you even see some brought some motion broadening of the uh, nucleus. Mm -hmm. This is the picture taken by uh, Mike Chibnick up in Rio Vista a few days before that. And he held the shutter open for a long time. And you can see the motion stretching from the comet motion. Mm -hmm. This is E3. Yeah. So the um, the reason it's in here is because of this picture. Wow. This is uh, um, the comet as it's going through the plane of our orbit. And so it's giving, the perspective is giving the appearance of opposing tails, but actually they're both fanning out in a V shape and we're looking head on at the V. Oh. So you can see the both tails there, the ion tail and the dust tail and more dust. Mm. Uh, which way would the sun be from that? Uh, the sun would be to our back. Yeah. Oh. It was essentially coming right toward us. And the, the dust tail fans out. And so you're seeing bits of it on either side of the nucleus. And then the ion tail isn't affected by that as much. You know, it's not spread out. So it's just shooting off. So the sun is probably slightly to the left. Uh, I don't know if this is flipped with a diagonal or whatever, but the sun would be slightly to the left and behind us. <laughs> now the pattern, the pattern part of my brain is picking out all sorts of little asterisms. There's a little line <laughs> yeah. down there that pops out. There's a uh, galaxy down there too. Yeah, yeah. There's galaxy there, there. Yeah, this is up at, near the North oh, Pole. It's easy that to looks find. Like, that might be M81 and M82 down there. Uh, could be. The cigar and Bode's galaxy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you would know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's pretty close to. Let's see if this. Um... Yeah. Okay. Because the way to get to um, to the cigar and Bode's is you go diagonally across Ursa Major, the bowl part of the dipper, from mm -hmm. the back corner toward the pointer star. Yeah, and and then you extend a little bit and come to the left, and so yeah, that yeah. that quite that, that could, could well yeah, be you're right, you're right, that could be. Mm -hmm. Now this is a composite photo. It's a yeah, either the cut or the stars should be streaks in something this um, um, oh, bright for the comet. So either that or it's one super fast F one Schmidt Cassegrain up on Mount yeah. Palomar or something. 
<laughs> you said it was intersecting our uh, the plane of our orbit. It didn't go inside our orbit, did it? No, it just passed through the plane. Okay. Went through the ecliptic. Isn't our plane pretty <laughs> much the same as all the other planets' planes? Yeah, that's the that's our ecliptic. Mm -hmm. But this sucker is not in. It doesn't go like in the same disc. Right. No, it doesn't. It just passed through that disc. Ah, and then it heads back. It's heading back, or is yep. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going is away. It, is it Wednesday night? It's going to be the closest. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about I right. So closest to us, Ron. Are you yeah. uh, if it's not raining and cloudy like it is today? Yeah. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, closest to us. It was closest to the sun a couple of days ago. Yes, right, right. Well, oh, this well, is this, a great this picture. One, this one was the astrophoto of the day of, about a week ago. This is the astrophoto of the day for um, Saturday when wow. I put together the talking points. Mount so this Etna. is Mount Etna. Yes. And the reason it's in there is because the spewing vapor from the... From the um, Volcano is analogous to the spewing vapor from mm, the that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think of Mount Etna, you know, as being covered in snow, but uh, I guess Italy's having a cold snap. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not clouds we're seeing, that's actual sulfur or whatever out of the well and water vapor, and that's what clouds yeah. are. And it's coming out of the mountain. Yeah. It's wow. volcano. I wouldn't want to breathe this stuff. Yeah. yeah. But. <laughs> you might want to go next to, after this to the Carilco things. <clears throat> to the what? Cariclo. Cariclo or whatever. Um, if you can. Okay. There it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're an occultation is about to happen here, right? No, this is a, this is one frame I took from a video. The um, smaller body here is passing through and it dims um, at key points, as you'll see from the light curve. This uh, is uh, Cariclo. Uh, yeah. It's like the Celtic pronunciation. Yeah. And uh, so it has two rings here that were discovered. This is from um, James Webb Telescope. Wow. So this I'm is- I'm just amazed they could, they could calculate this and point to James Webb that precisely, well, I'm not surprised they could point to James Webb that precisely, but they could calculate that from the point of view of the James Webb, this was going to happen. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, for the benefit of anybody watching that doesn't know what the hell we're talking about, this is a, <laughs> this is half uh, asteroid, half comet, and it's out past Saturn and not quite to Uranus, right? Yeah, no, it's, all, it's all asteroid. Oh, it's all asteroid. Well, it's a centaur, and there they often show cometary activity if they come closer to the sun. So right. it's it's one of those fuzzy things. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a comet that no one has pulled the trigger on yet. Yeah. <laughs> so so the string of beads across that those two round things that's the star in the distance. Yeah. Yeah, that's the positions of the star. Okay. And it's so making I'm... it look like the star is moving, but what's actually happening is Caraclo is moving. And it's oh. tracking Caraclo. Yeah. So this is the brightness of the star. Little noise there bouncing around. And when it passes through the double ring, you get a complete drop away for a very short instant of the brightness of the star. And then it missed Chariklo, so you don't get that dimming in there. And then on the other side, as it comes out, you get um, the, the uh, drop out again. And inside there, you can't really resolve it well on this scale, but you can resolve the two the two rings. Yeah, the denser one on the inside and the uh, thinner one on the outside. And because of the relative size of the particles in the rings, you get diffraction effects going on, and that's why you see it seem to brighten up on either side of the dip. Mm -hmm. See how there's little tiny peaks on either side of it. These mm -hmm. two there and these two there. Wow, it's got two rings, and therefore this rock has got to be like a dwarf planet. If it's got rings, wouldn't you? No, think? it's the it's the only known asteroid with rings. And Actually, the rings... there's one more. I think there's one more. Oh, the article I read said one, but if... yeah, isn't it? Things so... are always changing. Yeah. How? What's the diameter of it? 
Oh boy, I think something like okay. forty or sixty miles. It's not. Okay. It's not a real big thing like series at six hundred miles. Okay. So this one, um, this one gives a spectrum of the um, brightness of the light going through, and it gets dropouts when the ring goes by. It gets dropouts, and this is frequency. This is not time or distance. So the object is not moving left to right. This is a snapshot of the um, spectral content of its image or its light. And here we see a line characteristic of water ice here, here, and here. So the ring is uh, either a high proportion or made completely out of water ice. Well, I was totally wrong. I just did a quick Google search and it's 188 miles across. That's not a big change. That's not dwarf planet size. No, that's not enough to squish it into a sphere. Yeah. Oh, and you, there's an image of it in the background of the spectrum. You can see the 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 centaur and its rings. Does science tell us that hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms out there in space just floating around naturally want to all bond together two to one and become water? If they get near each other. But there's a lot of water in space. I mean, that's a lot of point. water. That's exactly what I was tr trying to get down. Yeah. Hmm. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So the big As a matter of fact, Earth could be considered a dry planet. Yeah. If you took all the water on Earth and um, put it all together, I think it would only make a sphere or a bubble 500 miles in diameter or something. Yeah. It's a tiny one of the uh, Night Sky Network uh, activity kits that they sent us has a, a model of the earth that's like 12 inches across. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you took all the water, it has a little tiny marble-ish size, kind of a small marble size bit. And that's what all the water would be. Mm. Wow. Well, isn't NASA gonna send something out to the water moons of either Saturn or Jupiter? I think it's Saturn, isn't it? Jupiter, Jupiter. Oh, it's Jupiter. Juice. Jupiter, juice. Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. Okay, yeah, juice. The juice. So Europa would be one. Yeah. Uh, that's not the one they're looking at mostly. I think it was Iapetus or something. Was no, it? that's around Saturn. Yeah, but the okay. juice mission is for the Jupiter icy moon. So it's Europa and uh, Callisto and Ganymede. Yeah. And they're going to land and see if there's something. I don't think they're going to land. They're going to orbit. Well, yeah. just orbit. It used to be called GIMO, J I M O, Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter. But when they brought on more partners for the European Space Agency, they changed it to Juice. Well, I and they reduced they reduced the budget repeatedly. Yeah. <laughs> so the the exotic lander that Jimo had is no longer there. Well, I had read or heard somewhere that uh, a nuclear thing that would be hot would land on one of those icy moons and just sink in. And that was, that was hypothesized. Proposed. Go ahead. I was, uh, go ahead, Jerry. You know more about it than I do. That was hypothesized back in the 90s for the GIMO mission. They were going to drop a nuclear reactor on the surface of Europa and let it um, melt its way through the ice cover into the ocean beneath the ice. And it would trail out a, a, an antenna behind it as it went down into the water. And, and they, the last view you'd get would be of a very large mouth approach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one would find a radioactive cooked fish. Yeah. <laughs> And they're probably salty. Yeah. Oh, salt, yeah, definitely. Salt is pretty common. All right. What are we looking at here, Jerry? This is what's going to happen. I think this is Wednesday. This is tonight. Oh, oh this tonight. Is, That's right. Tonight. We're still back on E3. No. No. Oh, what's happening? What are, this is the moon melting Mars. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. What's the big corona? What's the shell? Why are we... It's the brightness of the moon. It's a pretty bright moon. But the moon is a small dot in the middle of that? No, the, the moon's fairly small there, but you can see it. And then there's Mars, this little orange yeah. dot. Yeah, yeah right the there is the word moon yeah. on this thing. <laughs> and behind it is Mars. It was just beyond first quarter the other night. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the planetarium program I have is not faithful to the phase of the moon. Mm-hmm. So um, it will disappear to, behind the dark, the, you know, sh shaded uh, yeah. limb of the moon at something like eight, 
34. I've been telling people go out at 8.30 just so they don't miss it. And then about 50 minutes later, about 9.20 something, it'll pop out on the bright side of the moon. Right. Now, this is visible to people that are south of the 37th parallel. And so we're at 34. So we just see it, should see it skim behind the edge of the moon. Yeah. Farther up north in uh, Oregon, they're not going to see it. It's just going to go mm -hmm. through the rest. Of the Didn't this happen last week, too? Last month. M last, last month. month. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So the moon's, uh, the uh, Mars is in retrograde? <laughs> Hmm, I don't know. The moon, the, moon. the moon is moving much, much faster on it. It doesn't matter which way Mars is going. Yeah. Good right. point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the last occultation, Ron, the moon was full. So it's not this phase. Oh, okay. It caught up and, with it. Now the moon goes much faster past us, right? And this will make it much easier to see this phase. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's too bad there's no coronas and stuff to see beyond like you do with the sun, <laughs> with the solar eclipse. <laughs> if, if the sun were occulting Mars, you wouldn't be watching it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you plan to be out if it's not uh, overcast. If it's, it's not raining or overcast. It's okay. supposed to be clear. We'll see. Yeah. So we're in Taurus here. Mm -hmm. There's wow. M1. Nice little um, <coughs> post <-nova. Flash> <laughs> Yeah, We've got M45, the Pleiades down here with all the names crammed together. And got something there that's green, but I don't recall what it is. So. Those might, might be nebulae well, of this, some kind. Yeah, some kind of nebula, maybe a planetary or something. And there's another one over there. Okay. Seems to me green would be a rare color in space. Everything's either blue or It is. Blue. There are no green stars. But fluorescing oxygen is greenish blue. Right. So. Mm -hmm. hmm. well, I know that. Ah. What are we looking at here? Is the North American looking? Nebula and the Pelican Nebula. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There we go. You may remember it as NGC 7000. <laughs> so this over here looks like a pelican. There's the head. There's the bill. Uh -huh. and this looks like a map of North America. There's Mexico, mm -hmm. California, Florida. Ah, Florida is sinking the ocean. So um, the reason okay. that this is up there is because Astronomy Magazine pointed it out as a feature. It's very faint. You're probably not going to likely to see it in a telescope. It's a very big object. It's a wide field. Um, it's hard to see unless the sky is super dark. And but, now it's setting, so <laughs> you won't right. see it. That's right. So the, right. I don't know why they do things so close to the horizon. I guess they think some of their readers uh, <laughs> bed as soon as the sun sets. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> The, the interesting thing about this for me is that if you get an H2 filter, which you can buy from astronomy companies, and you put it on your telescope, then you only take pictures or look through. You can't look. There's too little light. But you can take long exposure pictures through the hydrogen uh, filter, hydrogen alpha filter, or the H2 filter. And you get this, because this is all glowing hydrogen. And there's nothing else on Earth here that emits that wave. The street lights at the drive-in don't um, don't emit it here. The in the parking lots they don't emit. People's backyard lights don't emit there. So you can take very long exposures, even from light polluted sites like Goleta here in Santa Barbara. Well, you, the LEDs might get you. Yeah, uh -huh. that my feel is from before LEDs. Yeah. But you can take dramatic pictures like this of the sky in uh, hydrogen alpha um, from light polluted areas. So it's one thing if you can't, if you want to take pictures of faint fuzzies and you're not in a really dark site, use these hydrogen filters, you can get wonderful results. Well, as Cygnus, the swan's bright tail star Deneb in that picture? No. No, it's not in there. Oh, no. okay. Three degrees due east of the nebula is two degrees. Let's see, two degrees times 12. Oh, it's that. You use binoculars 
because the mm -hmm. size of the sucker is two degrees by 12 and 0.3 degrees. Yeah, binoculars, you'd need to be in a really, really dark place to see this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there goes my order with Amazon. I'm not going to get that. Yeah. Well, DMZ between North and South Korea would probably work good. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so we're looking at a dust cloud that happens to be pink. It's not dust. It's hydrogen. No, it's hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen. We can see it. Yes. Hydrogen no, alpha light. It's it's when the electrons jump around between the first and second level. Mm -hmm. So this would not be just hydrogen atoms, uh, one per cubic meter. It, yeah. Really? Yeah. It just and looks more like than one per cubic. Well, yeah. What more than one per cubic kilometer, but one per cubic meter would be pretty dense. It would. Yeah. Yeah. Like about one one atom. Would, yeah. Would present us with this. Interesting. Uh, well, that's not we're looking through a lot of cubic meters. I suppose if you're a if you're a Star Trek fan from the original series, there's no real nebula that's like the Mutara Nebula, yeah. <laughs> where they had to actually. It's like uh, the Enterprise moving through a dense fog. There's there's not anything like that. But when they say it's a cloud of dust and gas, it's it, if it's gas, it's atoms. If it's dust, it's Remnants of an exploded star, wouldn't you think? Or, or the wind off of a red giant yeah. star, yeah. Yeah. Okay, wind with sometimes those little particles of solid yeah. material. Yeah, these carbon stars will put off carbon particles. Yeah. Those are more reflection nebulas than emission nebulas. Yeah. Well, yeah, the dust, the dust just reflects bluish light or, you know, scatters it in yeah. our direction, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like really scattering. It's the reason the sky is blue. Ah, uh, well, does anybody know uh, what the focus of Dr. Bassey's speech this Friday night is going to be when it says space weather? He's talking that about the solar wind and coronal mass ejections and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it affects us. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Auroras and uh, cell phone coverage and uh, power generation, power distribution. And it it uh, it affects um, astronauts if they're in space, like the space station, and it's going to be a big issue uh, for travel to the moon, which takes several days, or travel to Mars, which takes either seven months or forty five days if they ever get that nuclear rocket going. <laughs> so um, the it's going to be in space for a long time, and a, a coronal mass ejection comes, a lot of radiation to pass through your body. So yeah, they, even in, even high altitude uh, airline flights, you know, forty thousand feet over the poles, mainly right. the North Pole. Um, that's where the magnetic field lines bend back down toward the Earth, and it lets the radiation come in closer. So, those pilots and stewardesses have to uh, keep track of how many hours they've spent at those altitudes and on those flights. Really, and uh, long term radiation effects um, are more common in pilots and stewardess, steward eye than uh, in land-based or sea level based people. So well what what is it that affects our satellites and our electrical? Is that a big prominence from the sun that might reach out to this Cor th that's a coronal mass ejection. That's not a prominence. Well a prominence that's you know been blown completely off the sun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a super big prominence that erupts yeah. off the sun makes part of the sun with it but they're, they don't they'd never fry us or kill us or hurt us they, it, oh <laughs> <laughs> this, they, they might hurt why, us i don't know that they you know we have enough atmosphere and magnetic field at least now to protect us from that but there's that uh, um planetary system trappist something or other with nine uh -huh. planets and a couple of them in the goldilocks zone around this red dwarf star and but the star is much more active than our sun, and so um, getting your hopes up that the conditions might be right for life on any of those planets planets is tempered by the fact that there's a lot more coronal mass sections going on in that system than in Earth. Huh. I just learned that the ozone layer is just that. I for some reason I thought it was a spot that got. Uh, compromise, but the spot was a hole in the layer, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And ozone is O3, it's three yes. oxygen atoms. Yes. 
that that somehow in that layer they always want to connect it as a three. Sometimes the ultraviolet radiation from the sun knocks them apart, right? Back to O1 and O2. Yeah, it's mostly chemicals on the earth that knock them apart and destroy the ozone layer, like uh, chlorofluorocarbons or whatever, fluorocarbons, anyway, whatever they are. From why, do you, why do you suppose that happens only over the poles? That seems to be where those chlorofluorocarbons um, collected in the atmosphere, yeah. and also that's where you get more radiation coming in. Right. And it affects mostly Australia for some reason. Really? <clears throat> and I know when, we're, when I was down there, um, I noticed these school kids, elementary school kids going around with uh, on field trips everywhere, and they all wore broad-brimmed hats. <laughs> which is recommended uniform for down there because the sun can be so dangerous. Yeah. And their space program is based on a crooked rocket, I think, if you remember. It's <laughs> a, that was last week. Good memory. <laughs> but true. guaranteed to come back. Yeah. <laughs> Just watch out for it. Well, fantastic. What have we not talked about? Incidentally, Caraclo uh, is the name of just one rock, right? It's a special yeah. name. And it's also got the number 10199 on it. I don't know what that means, but that's from that's, your... That's the numbered asteroid it is where the orbit got determined. So it's one series, two Pallas, three Vesta, four Juno, da, 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 da. And now the numbers are up into like the six or eight hundred thousands. Ah, gotcha. Well, we're getting down to the wire, gentlemen. Anything on your mind, Tom? You want to weigh in while you can, Mr. Whittemore? Uh, you no, know. I'll just uh, we'll look for the comet tonight. And we'll take a look at the uh, Mars and the Moon. Okay. For, yeah. for outreach, we've got schools just really kicking up. So uh, mm. any uh, certified outreachers, please come out. We got Brandon School on this Thursday. And then, uh, of course, your, the meeting on Friday. And then we got Monte Vista School uh, uh, on uh, on the ninth, and San Inez School for nuts, Night Under the Stars on the tenth, and then the <laughs> Star the Party stars. on Saturday the eleventh. And uh, what does the weather look like for the eleventh? Any read? Ah, uh, yeah, I, too far ahead. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, during that uh, period of that one month of storms, we had nine of them. Did you know that? That's what they told us huh. in mid-December and just recently nine. I, I counted four or five. Well, they kind of merged. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they did. But it's How not much rain did we get total in inches? Anyone remember? It was uh, something like 18 or 19 inches on San Marcos Pass. Yeah. And our lake filled up. Or is yeah. that the Chuma cold? filled up. Yeah. It's great. Well, gentlemen, I guess we'll look forward to meeting together again on Wednesday, on Friday night. Uh, you have something? To, is it tomorrow night we got our first outreach, Chuck? It's on the second. Oh, okay. So Thursday. it's next Thursday. Uh, so that's Brandon Wednesday. School, Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay. Thursday night, Brandon School. I might even love to go join you, but I can't seem to get the vetting process done. I got to contact that lady if she'll talk to me. And I don't do we well. need to get do we need to get revetted every year? Um, I I know the Girl Scout vetting is good for two years. I'm not sure what the museum's process is. They might automatically uh, re redo people who have been done so that we don't have to do anything about it. But I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't heard okay. anything about having to redo it. Okay, sounds like a good report. We should have at our meeting on the second Saturday, which will be online again, right? You think Saturday meeting? Yes, the business meeting will be online for Tessa and others. Well, okay, let's assemble at uh, Planetarium right next door, Farron Hall on Friday night for Dr. Bassey's speech. Should be interesting as all get out. I hope he lets us ask questions mm -hmm. and uh, take care of yourselves and your wives and uh, be good into the new, uh, the new year 2023 with all more right. rain we need. Gentlemen, that'll do it. And I'll see you next, I'll see you Friday first. Then yeah. We'll Join us later. SBIU.